Miracles are in motion. I want you to hear me. Miracles are in motion. I know you've been on your feet and you're all tired, but miracles are in motion. That's a good spot right there to clap, shout, or wave. Or they're in movement. They're in movement. And God gave me a simple singular word about 2024. And he spoke this simple singular word to me, clarity. Clarity is coming. All the brain fog is going to get off of you. All the confusion is going to lift off of you. All the standing at the fork in the road thinking, do I go left or do I go right? And then, then when you make a decision, you're saying, did I make the right decision? God doesn't intend his sons and daughters to live in confusion, in chaos, <clears throat> or in indecision. He intends us to have clarity. The steps of righteous people are ordered of the Lord, which means they've been architecturally designed by God. And if they're architecturally designed by God and we listen to God, we're not going to be in question, did I go left when I should have gone right? Did I sell when I should have held on? Are you following me? Did I go through the wrong door? How many believe God's gonna give you divine clarity? I'm going to get more into it as the year ends and the new year begins. And we live through so many different things in life, but I just keep hearing clarity and miracles are in motion. They're in movement. And I, I want you to grab those two things today, start declaring them over your life, and start believing God for breakthroughs in your life. Service tonight's at 6.30 in case you didn't know. But I'm, I'm not going to a scripture right now. I want to go to some PowerPoints here to lay some groundwork. I want to talk about gifts. A gift is a thing given willingly to someone with no payment expected. Given to show honor and favor. A gift is a thing or something given willingly, everybody say willingly, to someone with no payment expected, given to show honor and favor. In the biblical sense, there are three realms of gifts in the biblical sense, three types of biblical gifts. One is gifts that people give to other people. So we, we read and we study about gift giving in the Bible and it is people, one sense of it is people giving something to other people. Gifts that people would bring per se to a king. Gifts that were given to family members. But they're the gifts that people give to other people. Number two, gifts given to God is an act of worship. When you understand something, this topic right here is probably the singularly most, I, it, it is the singularly most discussed topic in the Bible, is the orders of God concerning how his people will give gifts to God. We would call them in some cases sacrifices, or we could call them offerings, or we could call them tithe. But in all cases, they are gifts, whether it was an animal sacrifice, a financial gift, whatever it might be, a gift of the first fruits of the fields, whatever it was, it was a gift. Put the definitions back up. Gifts given to God as an act of worship. And then the third type are gifts given to mankind by God. You with me? So there's you giving gifts. Then there is you giving gifts to God as an act of worship. And then the, may not first or last in any of these. The third point is gifts given to mankind 
by God. How many realize how much you have received with the gifts that God has given to mankind? Now, one more point I want to get into. Go to the next one. The refusal of a gift was regarded as a high indignity. The refusal of a gift was regarded as a high indignity or an insult. It was also an insult to not bring a gift when the occasion demanded it. It was also an insult to not give a gift when the occasion demanded it. That had a lot to do with people appearing before leaders, kings, emperors, governors, whatever it might be. The common practice was that when you walked into the presence of someone in authority, you brought a gift. And that's where the scripture comes that a man's gift made room for him. And a lot of times people get real spiritual with that, which is not inaccurate. But in reality, it was talking about when you came before someone of influence or authority and you brought the proper gift, it created room for you. It created an audience. It created attention. And we have got to become people not of a closed fist, but of an open hand. Because God wants us, I I, I believe we first need to learn the principles of giving gifts to one another. It's a good thing to give gifts to one another. I've told this story before, years and years and years ago, and uh, so don't try to figure out who it was. Uh, But many, many years ago, I had a staff member, and a lot of times I'll take a staff member out and buy him a suit or something of that nature. And, but years ago, I I wanted to do this for this uh, member of our staff. And I said, I want you to meet me over here at this particular clothing store, and I'd like to take you and buy you a, a suit. And so he says, well, before we go in, we need to sit down over here and talk about this. I said, talk about what? Well, I just, I just kind of wanted to ask you what your motives were in this. I, I was thinking right then, my motive right now is to fire you. <laughs> and so I had to have this long, transparent conversation about why I wanted to give this person a gift. He worked for me for many years after that, and I never gave him anything after that. Because you have to learn not only how to give, but you also have to learn how to receive. Because sometimes it's important when a person gives that they have the right to give and maybe you were the target of their generosity, but also their giving became a key to their blessing. I've, I've sit, years back when we pastored in Indiana, I had a, a man walk up to me and they were having a lot of financial problems. We were in the middle of the recession and uh, they were only working one shift at the GM factory that usually worked three shifts. People were laid off. And this man, uh, this was probably around 1981, somewhere around in there. This man came up to me and he said, I want to give $100. Well, in 1980, $100 was a lot more than what $100 is now. And I knew their situation, and I said, I cannot receive this. I know the problems you guys have financially, and I'm not going to take this. Tears begin to stream down his face. He said, you're going to deny me my blessing? I said, here, give it to me. And he put it in my hand and we prayed over it. And within a week, he was back to work. But he knew that when he gave it, 
that there was a blessing connected to it. So we have to learn how to be people of the open hand to give, but also people of the open hand to receive because sometimes what they're doing for us is small compared to what God will do for them by them being obedient to God. Is anybody in the house? But then we recognize in, in giving, go back, to, uh, go back to the three types of giving. We realize that in gifts, there are gifts that are given to God as an act of worship. And so whenever you're giving, you have to look at your giving, your tithing, your offerings, giving of yourself, your time, your, your abilities. Many of you have so many great talents and abilities that are a blessing to people and a blessing to the house of God. And I, I just have to say, when we learn that part of the gift giving principle is our gift giving that is an act of worship, every time you tithe, it is not a legal thing. It is an act of worship. When you give an offering to help a ministry preach the gospel to the north, south, east, and west, it is not just giving to a project. It is a giving as an act of worship. When you make a sacrifice, you are doing something that is an act of worship. And the Bible talks about how when we worship God, we worship God in spirit and in truth. Every time we sow a seed, it should be an act of worship and it should be wrapped up in the anointing and in the spirit of God. I'm not real good. We've got huge projects right now that we're in the middle of at this church. I've got them pressing me right now that I need to strike a check for $225,000 for some things. And you say, Pastor, uh, you need to raise a project offering. I probably do. But you know something? I want you to learn how to give, not to buy something. I want you to learn how to give, to give is an act of worship. It's wonderful if you give an offering so you have a pew to sit on or we have a better microphone to preach through or we can paint a wall or we can re-carpet a room. That's all great because it honors the house of God. But you have to learn how to move in the spirit. And if God says sow a thousand dollar seed, you're not saying, well, what's it gonna be used for? You're saying this is an act of worship. It is an act of obedience to honor God and to bless the house of God and to bless the work of ministry. It all doesn't have to just be attached to buying a chair. Boy, it got quiet. We're, we're giving the first $15,000 that comes into the Christmas offering this year to purchase one of the buses that are going into the foreign field. One's already been purchased for Nepal. The other one's being purchased that we're buying for the Philippines. And that's a wonderful thing to provide those kids with a bus. But the truth of the matter is we got to learn how to give is an act of worship. We can't attach every time we write out a check to a project, to a bus, to a car, to a wall, to a bucket of paint, to a, a pew, to a, a yard of carpet. No, we've got to attach what we do is an act of honoring God and an act of blessing the work of the kingdom of God. I don't know if anybody's grabbing any of this, but I pray that you are because when we do that, then God begins to give. And when God begins to give gifts, they are supernatural. They are gifts of signs and wonders and miracles. They are gifts of healing and prophecy. They are gifts of peace and joy and love. They are the things that you can't buy at the mall or online. They are things that come from the throne room of God in his presence. Doesn't anybody hear me today? When you are in his presence for five minutes, you get more out of being in his presence for five minutes than you can get in five Five years of natural activities. I know people are looking for a lot of things with church because everybody's used to shopping. And then we come in the doors and we create all our expectations. 
Because we think we know what we need. We think we know. And we approach it in the way we approach most things from up here. Oh, this is what my soul needs or my emotions need. Your landmark moments are not having pie and coffee with somebody. I got the 12 disciples on that. No, your landmark moments as a son and daughter of God are not having pie and coffee with people. That's good, especially if the pie is good and the coffee is from Hawaii. I love peach pie, especially when it's just not hot but warm. Now you got to get it just the right temperature. And then you put a little haagen ice cream on the top of it. And then... When you brew up a pot of Kona coffee and you put just a little bit of half and half in it, not a lot because the Kona coffee is so smooth, and you sit down with your warm peach pie with the haagen ice cream and just the right amount of half and half in the Kona coffee, and you look across the table and you see somebody you like and you're just having wonderful conversation. It's so special. But right here, when the power of the Holy Ghost gets released from the throne room of God and you're battling hell on earth, there is no peach pie haagen coffee or Kona coffee, haagen ice cream or Kona coffee, I knew that wasn't coming out right, that can do what God can do in five seconds in his presence. You walk into the presence of God because the Bible said the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. When the Holy Ghost begins to manifest itself, I hold back because sometimes you know you just know some Somebody needs a touch from heaven. Somebody needs hands to be laid on them. Oh, but tradition says, let's preach first, then we'll pray for a few people. You know what makes Word of Life what it is? You know what makes it a five-star restaurant? You know what makes it? It's because when the Holy Ghost says, I'm getting ready to touch somebody's life and remove the burden and destroy the yoke, that's when God God starts giving gifts from heaven that will forever change your life. You ought to be up here and just look at you. That's why I'm going to preach on clarity because some of you look very confused right now. <laughs> Because I'm violating all of your preconceived principles. Because see, church is not just about us getting together in that get together sense. No, church is about coming into the presence of God. And see, what we've lost is our respect for the presence of God. What we've lost is our hungering and our thirsting for the presence of God. And with all due respect, I love every one of you. You're the sweetest, most wonderful, greatest people that have ever walked on planet Earth that are watching online. And remember, when you give, go to wolcc.net. I just want you to get that and how much I love you. But I'm going to tell you something, whether you really believe me or not, you will not get where you are what God does here. There is a presence that comes into the sanctuary and I don't know how much you feel when it comes through the online streaming. I know that God works and God moves. People are bringing offerings down. Praise God. That's a good thing. But see what happens is I don't know about you, but when I get in the presence of God, see when when Poochie began to lead worship today, there was a moment that the atmosphere shifted and I could feel the shift and Pastor Gala comes over and said I don't know if anybody feels this but me but it's thick in here right now I said I feel it and I could tell tears were streaming down people's faces people were lifting up their hands and getting breakthroughs what am I 
driving at. When you are in the presence of God, you are in a gift receiving experience. So God teaches us to give gifts to each other. And it's a good thing to do that, Tristan. You remember that. That's when you don't look at the balance on the credit card. You don't look at how much money's in your checking account. You just think how much you love your wife. And there's no price too great for her. Isn't that right, Alicia? Okay. Just, I, see, that's how all your husbands ought to think. Just, you know, just get, get Joe, just get this revelation. It's a good thing to give gifts. And I preach this message every time. Wise men give wise gifts because the reason the gifts that were given uh, at the nativity or at the, at the manger were, uh, or wherever they were exactly given uh, they had to do with gold, frankincense, and myrrh because the three wise men understood who they were giving to. I do want to say this to you that we used to have a member in our church that they were very successful. They were professional people and they had an anniversary and I asked him what he got his wife and he said, I bought her an electric horse brush for our anniversary. I never knew such a thing existed, but I thought to myself, oh, I bet that that really brought out the wine and the roses that evening. And uh, so when you know who you're giving to, you know, when you know who you're giving to, you don't give a Raiders t-shirt to me. Okay, you don't do that. Now, Ken Peters back here, you can give him a Raiders t-shirt because he thinks that's an anointed prayer cloth or something. But see, when you know who you're giving to, you, you give gifts that are in agreement with who that person is and what they like and what they dislike. You don't give me pink golf balls. That's not the right thing to do. But what I'm saying with it, the, the, the wise men gave gold and the, because they knew he was a king. They gave frankincense because they knew he was the great high priest. And they gave myrrh because they knew he would be the suffering savior that would lay down his life. They knew whom they were giving to. And so here these men were giving gifts to the incarnate Christ. And that when we learn how to give, even as they did as an act of worship, when you learn how to give as an act of worship, God begins to open up the windows of heaven. Now stay with me on this. That when you give as an act of worship, then the next layer of giving, God opens the windows of heaven and he pours out blessing that there is not room enough to contain. We put all that into a financial box. There's sometimes you need peace more than you need money. There's sometimes you need healing more than you need an extra hundred dollars. There's sometimes you need joy more than you need a raise. I know that's hard for some of you men to get your head around, but just stay with me on this. But when God begins to give gifts, those gifts begin to intervene in our life in unique and powerful and in miraculous ways. So now, let's, let's go to 2 Corinthians 9, chapter the 15th verse. I'm not going to hold you more than another couple hours. So, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable, or most other translations say indescribable gift. Thanks be unto God for his undescribable gift. 2 Corinthians 9, 15. When God <clears throat> begins to release a gift in your life, you can't even, you can't even put words to it. You, you, you can't even describe it. It's indescribable. It's unspeakable. And God begins to release gifts into your life. And when he begins to send things from heaven, how many know there's things that have come into your life that have been a direct extension from heaven to earth? Thy will be done in earth as it already is in heaven. Well, what happens? God extends what's in heaven to earth to you. And those kind of gifts are indescribable. Then go with me to John three sixteen. You shouldn't have to look at it. For God so loved the world that he gave. Everybody say gave. gave. His only begotten son, the greatest gift that humanity has ever received is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and then everything that the Lord Jesus Christ was as word made flesh dwelling among us begin to be manifested on the face of the earth. When you're in the presence of the Lord, peace will come to your mind because he is the Prince of Peace. When you're in the presence of the Lord, healing and health will begin to touch your body because he is the healer. When you're in the presence of God, no matter what your need may be, God is the deliverer. God is the way maker. God is the wisdom that you need in your thought processes. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So he gives his son and then his son gives us everlasting life. You are not doomed to die. You're going to live forever. No, did you hear me? I said, you're going to live forever. I'm, I'm preaching to somebody online. I said, you're going to live forever. I got to get some help. I said, you're going to live forever. It doesn't matter what the enemy throws at you. And people say, well, the victory didn't come to that person. They died. Are you kidding me? When we breathe our last breath of oxygen on earth, we're breathing our first breath of glory in heaven. What do you mean it didn't work out? It all works out. Because when you have Jesus, you have everlasting life. And the devil will put fear in you and intimidation in you and cause you to fear eternity there is nothing in eternity to fear your body will be better your thinking will be perfect your everything about your life will be greater than you have ever 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 experienced here on earth everybody freaked out during COVID because people were dying I don't make light of that but the truth is if you are a believer you exchange oxygen for glory you you exchange this mortal body for immortality. You exchange this corruptible nature for incorruption. What am I saying? You are going to live forever. Because God gave you a gift. Do you hear me? I say God gave you a gift. So I don't particularly want to go right now. I don't think you ever want to go till it's the timetables of God. Then the word goes on in John 14, 27. John 14, 27 says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. How many thank God for peace that surpasses understanding? Peace is not a reaction to proper circumstances. Peace is a permanent condition in a believer. That it really doesn't matter what is happening. Peace rules your thoughts and your emotions. Oh, you're just in denial. Come on. You've heard those guys. When anybody rises up and says, you know, it's all going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. I just know everything's going to be all right. You're in denial. Well, maybe you're denying the works of the enemy. And maybe you're denying what your carnal mind is telling you. But if you have the peace of God that surpasses understanding, it guards your heart and it guards your mind. It causes you to think different. You don't have to be in chaos. You don't have to be on the verge of a meltdown. You don't have to be on the verge of an anxiety attack and walk around and have a paper bag in your purse or in your pocket. Come on. You don't have to live like that. You are a recipient of eternal life. You have an indescribable gift. You have peace that's indescribable because it surpasses your understanding. How can I be at peace? This is happening. That's happening. How can I be at peace? Uh, all these things are going wrong. How can I be at peace? You're at peace because peace is not a reaction. It is a spiritual condition. When you're born again and you have Christ, he is the prince of peace, therefore you are the recipient of peace. But if you want to insult him, reject it. 
You just thought I wouldn't get back to that, didn't you? See, when God starts handing out gifts, he doesn't want you to ask him his motive. He doesn't want you to push it back and say, I don't know about, no, I am giving you my peace. So what do you have to do with the gift that's given? You have to receive it. And a lot of times it's hard for you in the carnal realm to receive what God gives because his thoughts are higher and his ways are higher. I'm preaching better than you're shouting right now. Philippians chapter four, verse seven, I've been quoted it. And it said that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. So when that peace comes to you, it says it's peace is a gift. My peace I give to you, it's a gift. And when you receive the peace of God, it guards your heart and it guards your mind. And when the enemy comes at you and he's trying to promote chaos in your life and worry and anxiety and emotional meltdowns and mental and emotional chaos, you need to step back and say, wait a minute I remember the Lord gave me peace and I declare in the name of Jesus the peace of God that surpasses understanding I release it to guard my heart and mind you have to understand something faith comes by hearing and when you stop declaring the word of God you stop the benefits of whatever he has given you Still here? Matthew 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How many have felt like I'm under a heavy load? I'm not saying the last five minutes, but how many have felt like in this year you have had moments that you were under a heavy load? Okay, the Lord just says, come to me. Come to me. Let me see your hands again. How many of you have had some labor and some heavy laden? And you've had a lot on you. Come on, wave your hand. How many have had a lot on you? Okay, now, what does he say? You come to me. You come to me, and I will give you rest. It's a gift. Well, how much is it? You don't have to pay for it. I already paid for it. It's my gift to you. Now, you got a choice to make. Either you're going to give the Lord that good feeling that he gets by giving, or you're going to insult him. Now, it's amazing. God, please help me. I'm under such a load. God, please help me. I'm so burdened out. Oh, God, please help me. Oh, God, the load I'm carrying, I don't know if I can carry it anymore. And the Lord says, well, what did I say? Oh, you said come to you. Well, why don't you get busy and come to me? And you say, well, I I am coming. I'm telling him how burdened and heavy laden I am. No, why don't you just come to him and say, I need rest. And you told me if I came to you, you would give me rest. This isn't that difficult. No, people say, oh, pastor, you preach too complicated sometimes. No, this is really kindergarten stuff. This is very simple. Just come to God and he will give you rest. You don't have to tell him what you're burdened with. (laughs) Now I'm getting you all upset. You do not have to spend an hour telling God all your troubles. I know how God feels. Oh, I do. I see certain people come in the hallway and I'm saying, that's why I have security. Nobody's going to shoot me. They're just going to, they're just going to say so much to me that I don't care whether I live or die after I get out of their presence. I know in the conversation, I always say, pastor, I need you to pray about this. And if I reach out to pray, no, no, I just can't reach out and pray. No, I got to hear about what I got to pray about. The gala just calmed down. And she's doing the subliminal cross thing. I rebuke that pastor spirit. No. If you say I need prayer, 
Why can't I just say, Father, in the name of Jesus, your word declares I shall supply all your need according to my riches that are in glory. And I declare that whatever the need is, body, soul, or spirit, the power of the Holy Ghost will remove the burden and destroy the yoke and make a way where there seems to be no way. Now, I can take another 15 minutes and get all the articulate details, but it won't change the prayer. No, I said it will not change the prayer. What you have to begin to understand, it's simple. He said, if you are burdened and heavy and laden, come to me. It didn't even say, tell me about it. He just said, come into my presence. Come into my presence and I will give you rest. Do you realize when many of you broke loose today and you said, I'm going to press in and come to the front of the building, you say, oh, that's just simple. No, it is saying, God, I'm leaving where I'm at and I'm coming in, as the man of God said, to get a touch from heaven. And the minute you set foot down here, something began to happen. Maybe you had to wait a few minutes, but you started worshiping God. His breath in my lungs. I'll pour out my praise. You started worshiping. You started glorifying God. What had you done? You had come unto him. And you know what he did? He gave you rest. He gave you rest. Some of you go sleep better than you slept all month tonight. You have been in the presence of God. That's where people don't understand the real purpose of the house of God. The real purpose of the house of God is as we glorify and as we worship God and as we preach the gospel and as we minister in the gifts of the Spirit, there is a presence that comes into the house. God inhabits the praises of his people. Would you not when you feel that presence and when you walk into it he gives you rest I don't know how many times I've stepped into this pulpit in the 38 almost 39 years that I pastored this church and I was labored and heavy laden it could have been financial stresses it could have been circumstances that were happening to my left hand and right hand. Could have been a lot of different things. Oh my God. But the atmosphere would shift. And the presence of God would come on me. And come on Pastor Gala. And I felt the burdens remove. And the yokes get destroyed. I know I'm old school, but I think when you're anointed to do whatever it is you're anointed to do, you don't stop doing it when you get burdened and heavy laden. You just come on in and say, God, let your presence come upon me. Some of you need to learn how to praise God in your house. You need to learn how to praise God in your car. You need to learn how to shut off the stuff and turn on the things that will cause you to get rest. And then you're gonna look and say, everything's gonna be all right. Everything's gonna be all right. Oh, I, I, but then Luke 10, 19 says this, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Behold, I give unto you power. Everybody say power. You got power. It's a gift. No, just real simple. You have power. You have dunamis. You have a Holy Ghost stick of dynamite on the inside of you. You have power. No, I, I'm, I'm talking to somebody. I, 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 I think somebody's hearing me. You, you, you have power. I need to know what demon I'm up with. No, you don't. Why is everybody always so interested in what the devil's name is? I remember watching people, you know, casting devil's eyes. What's your name, devil? I could care less. I just don't care. I don't want to know his name. I don't want to dialogue with him. I don't want to have a conversation with him. 
I don't want to know how many kids he has. I don't want to know where he went to college. I don't, are you following me? I have no interest in having any conversation with him except to tell him to go back to the pit of hell from whence he came and take his hands off my family, take his hands off my body, take his hands off the people of Word of Life Christians. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's the only conversation I need to have because he said, I've given you power over how much of the power? Over all the power of the enemy. Well, what it's a legion. I've given you power over all the power of the enemy. If every devil in hell comes out of hell at you, God said, I've given you power over all the power of the enemy. God is not raising up a generation of spiritual wimps. He's raising up a generation, mighty men and mighty women of God, that when you say, devil, get thee behind me, he immediately gets behind you. When you say, come out, he comes out. When you say, leave, he leaves. You have power, and it's a gift that was given to you. I talk about Brother Boatwright a lot. And, but one of my greatest memories of being in Brazil with him, and uh, Marilyn, I don't know if you know, but we're so blessed to have Marilyn as a part of our church, and she's Brother Boatwright's daughter. And so Slim finally got through to her in heaven and got her to Denver to come to this church. But her dad, if, when you hear me refer to him, just think of John Wayne. That's just think of John Wayne with a size 16 ring finger. And so we're in the state of Parana in Brazil, and there was a Macumba temple right across the street. Now, a lot of people think all this stuff's just dreamed up in movies, but about halfway through the service, these demonically oppressed or possessed uh, Macumba people started coming in, kind of hands stretched out like walking zombies. Now, this, this wasn't at some goofy party this was a true manifestation of the demonic and they come into the church and so people start they know what they are so they're trying to rebuke the devil and everything else and bodies are flying and chairs are flying it's it's getting kind of crazy i had no interest leaving the platform at that moment i was singing put your hand in the hand of the man that stilled the waters and i was totally happy and Boatwright looked over at me, Brother Boatwright looked over at me, and he said, I'm going to give them one more minute. And if they don't get anything dealt with, I'm going to have to go take care of this. I said, I- I'll sing. <laughs> I'm, I got your back. That's what people say when they don't want to get in the fight. They just want you to let you know you're, they're behind you. I got your back. Looked at his watch, chairs flying, missionaries getting thrown up against the wall. It it was getting, you talk about up close and personal, it was getting there. Walks off the platform. I'll be back in a minute. Said, I'm thinking, yeah, about an hour from now I'll see you. He just walked off the platform, found the first one. Come here, Clay. Finds the first one, just grabs him. About like that. Cut out! Bam! Guys on the floor. There were six of them. Walks to the next one, grabs him. Come out! Bam! He hits the floor. Walks to the third one. Cut out! Bam! He hits the floor. When he said a minute, he meant it. Six times, about 10 seconds, with 60 seconds, he came back up. Well, got that taken care of. And then the missionary stepped in and got every one of them saved and every one of them filled with the Holy Ghost. But he knew he had power. 
Now, I'm not talking about somebody that was having a bad day. He knew he had power over all the power of the enemy because God had given him that power. I want you to hear me on this. God has given you power over all the power of the enemy. And when you walk into a room, Satan ought to walk out of the room. My father-in-law used to say, when I walk in a room, the devil walks out. And I believe that's the kind of swagger we ought to have in the Holy Ghost. I know I've been going down a frontage road here, but you need to understand your home does not need to be infected with demonic oppression. Your business does not need to be oppressed with unclean spirits. Your marriage does not need to be manipulated by ungodly spirits. Rise up, plead the blood, rebuke the devil, and watch the peace of God guard your heart and mind. If you believe it, shout yes. Okay, okay. Uh, John 8, 12 says, I am the light. John 8, 12. Then Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world, and he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. So when, when he comes into the light, into your life, light comes into your life. Depression is not your birthright. If he is in you, light is in you. When you walk in a room, you should dispel darkness. Oh, we, we're so intimidated by the corporate world. Just walk in the room and let the light dispel the darkness. You don't have to preach a sermon. You don't have to take a text. Just show up. Just show up. I was at a, at a meeting a while back, years ago, we were trying to buy, uh, sell the other building on Dry Creek and Clarkson and buy this land. And I remember uh, we had a Jewish attorney. You need a good Jewish attorney uh, if you really want to get things done. Uh, they're the best. And I had a Jewish attorney. And he was there in the meeting representing Word of Life. We're trying to finalize the negotiations between us and the Episcopal Church that bought our building a Dry Creek and Clarkson. And it was one of those meetings. And everybody had an opinion because it was me and their board of directors and my Jewish attorney. And all their board of directors had all sorts of opinions. And I said, you know what? I think we need to pray. And they all looked at me like, well, I, I guess that's an option. I say, let's join hands. And so they all join hands and the Jewish attorney's looking at me. Said, Give me your hand. I got his hand and I said, you take his other hand. And I started praying. Now I didn't speak in tongues. I was very restrained. But I started praying. I said, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke the confusion that's in this room. And I declare the peace of God. And I declare you're going to give us wisdom. And I declare all the articulate details that got to get resolved in the midst of all this thing is going to be worked out and it's going to be resolved. I love all these people in this room. And I know, God, we're going to come into the unity of the Spirit. And we're going to get this done for the glory of the kingdom so their church can move forward. And we can build our new church. And we can get all of this done. And all of a sudden, I could feel my hand and it was shaken and it was the Jewish attorney on my hand and he was shaken and all of a sudden I, I said amen and everybody looked like they're about ready to fall out under the power we walked out of that room 15 minutes later and the plan was all laid out and so all the Episcopal folks left and I'm there with my Jewish attorney and he said I just want you to know Reverend if we're ever in a meeting again and you feel to do that praying thing just go right ahead I've never felt anything like that in my life and I kind of like it but see when you walk in a room and you have the light in you then the light dispels the darkness and you don't have to be anywhere in the dark okay on the home stretch on the home stretch John 10 28 says this I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Go to Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then Ephesians 2.8 says this. 
For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. I'm not saved by works. I'm saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God. The wages of sin, you earn the destruction that sins bring, sin brings, which is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So you work all your life doing all the things you shouldn't do. And the enemy's saying, I've got you now. I've got you now. And the Lord walks in the room. He says, you believe in me? Yes, I believe in you. But here's my gift. You should have died and went to hell. But here's your gift. Eternal life. You didn't have to pay for it. Where's the bill? There is no bill. It's paid for. I shed my blood. I paid for it. For you, for your family, for the whole church, for men and women out of every culture, every race, every financial background. I paid the price for it. Eternal life is never earned. It is a gift. That's the one thing that differentiates Christianity from every other religion of the world. Salvation in every other religion in the world is like the counterbalance of sin. The wages of sin is death. But then the wages of good works is eternal life. No, the wages of sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life. You're not saved because of works. You're saved through grace by faith. And God gives you a gift. And I have been the blessed recipient of eternal life. I have been the blessed recipient of life. I have been the blessed recipient of rest. I have been the blessed recipient of power. I have been the blessed recipient of every good thing that you can extract from Scripture that God says is given unto you. The gifts of the Holy Ghost. What are the, the gifts? Faith, healing, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, discerning of spirits, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. They're all gifts. Whether you get it or not, I'm a gift to you. For God gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints so you can do the work of ministry. But I'm not here as a product of a university. I'm here as a gift. There's a difference between a man that's sent from God and a hireling. In all types of churches, they get pulpit committees together, as they'd call them, and they interview all sorts of wonderful people to pastor churches. But there's a difference between being sent somewhere and being hired. Because the guys that get hired get a better job offer down the road and say, I love this church, but I've got an opportunity to pastor one that's double the size and double the compensation. Well, you want to know something? In 39 years, it hadn't been all easy. In 39 years, it hasn't been all overflow. In 39 years, it hasn't been, oh, wow, I'm a hero every day. You find out one thing in ministry, you're a hero on Monday and a zero on Tuesday. You've got people that have told you, I will be with you for the entire journey till death do us part and God takes us to heaven and then they let you know they're not with you anymore. What happened? You can't get a straight answer. Because they're too spiritual to give you a straight answer. They're too spiritual to say, I'm offended. Because if you do that, then you got to deal with the offense. Oh, it's quiet. Because you all got friends that fit that category. Truth of the matter is, you learn one thing as a man of God. When you're put there by God, you lay down your life for the sheep. You lay down your life. Say, what if you got offered a church that was five times this size and five times the income? What would you do? I said, I would think about it. But I would stay where God wanted me to be. Say, why? Because I'd rather be 
in the center of God's will than anything else. Because when that day comes that you have to stand before God, you want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I can't reject these gifts. I can't reject what he offers to me. I can't reject his God-given opportunities. And when you walk like that, ladies and gentlemen, you will be blessed every day of your life. Is anybody happy in the house? He gave me life. He gave me light. He gave me joy. He gave me rest. He gave me peace. He gave me this indescribable gift. And all I can say to you is you'll unwrap a lot of wonderful things under the tree this year. But don't forget, don't forget the greatest gifts that you have. Didn't come from the Park Meadows Mall or Neiman Marcus or Saks Fifth Avenue or Nordstrom's or Target or Walmart. They came from heaven. They came from heaven. And if you have those, you can make it through anything life throws at you. Let's give God a great praise today. Let's stand across the house. I've prayed with virtually all of you. Thank you, Jesus. I want you just for a moment, I want you just for a moment to thank God for all that he's blessed you with. Thank God for all that he's done for you. And Poochie, could you sing my wife's favorite song, Your Presence is Heaven to Me? And I just want you to lift your hands up toward heaven. And just for a moment, just for a moment, I just want you to thank God for all his gifts. This may sound silly to you, but maybe you ought to sit down, take a piece of paper and write the Lord out a thank you letter. Sometimes people give us something at Christmas. And my wife's so good at this. She'll sit down and she'll write somebody a thank you note or a thank you card and express to them how much she appreciated what they did. But I wonder if we ever sat down and written God a thank you. We, th- we tell him. But maybe you ought to sit down and say, God, let me thank you for all these gifts that came from heaven into my life. Just slip your hands up. Just worship God. Go ahead, son. Thank you for joining our service today. In order to rewatch this service and not miss future services, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Are you looking for more information on Word of Life Christian Center? Visit us at wolcc.net, Facebook, or Instagram. If your life was impacted by today's service and would like to support the work of the ministry here at Word of Life, you can give by simply going to wolcc.net and pressing the Give tab. You can also give on our Church Center app. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you soon.